he just says that the most common form of stupidity is uh, forgetting the purpose. That seems that that plays a a great role here. Um. So, but and it also pushes us back into this question of stupidity. So, I I mentioned before. Herder, 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 who didn't really want to study with Kant, with the master of reason, as it were, in Koenigsberg, but uh, chose to study with another of the uh, great professors there, um, in a way reproached himself for being uh, too, uh, quote unquote, idiosyncratic. So the idiosyncratic has something to do with the idiot. And um, here we don't know. So one question I'm posing is, um, here we are, we're reading Heidegger, and Heidegger has, in the beginning of this 38, 39 uh, notes for his lecture th series on uh, Nietzsche's essay on the advantage and disadvantage of history, um, he makes more of his remark right at the very beginning is, though um, almost outside the, uh, all the considerations themselves, he makes some more of his characteristic remarks, which he's been making all along, and it's so that we can say it's not tied to the fact that uh, he got into this trouble in the uh, Nazi period, and that's still Vex. But all along, he's been making these comments since his early days about um, we don't want to worry about biography, and here he specifically makes some mocking remarks about the so-called personality of the thinker. Of uh, Nietzsche is a very interesting personality. And uh, one can well see that anyone who studies uh, Carl Jung can see that the Jung uh, spends a great deal of time on the personality of uh, Nietzsche. So this concept of personality has uh, been developed quite a bit by Goethe, so a little before the year 1800, and Goethe understand personality something like um, mm, a distinct or let's just say a, a, a great man is a personality a, a truly great man or uh, a truly great individual and uh, you see this concept coming up of the individuation in the German sphere um, by the time it gets to Jung, Jung still does not have what we have now if you think of Jordan Peterson, all the personality, uh, the intelligence spectrums and all these kind of things, that, uh, some of which stem from Jung. But Jung s still spoke of his typology in terms of saying, uh, this is simply my way to communicate to people uh, what I see. It's, a, uh, it's an instrument, instrumentarium. It's, it's a way of describing things. He doesn't put a lot of weight on the actual existence, the, the objective existence of the, of the uh, personality traits in the way we do now when we almost make uh, the intelligence test and the personality test into the equivalent of an experimental psychology uh, issue. Like, uh, I mean, in the sense that you had in former times, you had uh, um, the soul psychology, the, the three-part psychology of Plato, and then you switch over to... Uh, experimental psychology, which whereby you can know what we, you basically exclude the ought. You just say, this is how it happens. Um, so Heidegger makes those comments as though we were not supposed to speak about any of these trivial issues, but then what's his purpose? So to get to being, but he talks about all kinds of extraneous matters, and it's seemingly they're surrounded by, on the one side, some concept of science, on the other side, a concept of direct or mystical or poetic uh, direct reception of the things, and then in between this opening of the Dasein, which has this flank like this. Uh, So what's our purpose in this investigation? Uh, later on, Heidegger has this comment from one of the students who's saying, uh, 
for us in America today, uh, the difference between the animal and the human being isn't so great. After Heidegger has gone through a lot about this determination. And, uh, uh, and then he says, oh, well, here and now we're not going to concern ourselves with, as it were, the general opinions of people here and there. It may not be only the Americans that think this way. Okay, here and now. Uh, but it does seem that all along he's been bringing in things that can't possibly be at the closest level the attempt to envisage what's coming uh, to us in the factizita, uh, the factizity of Dawson is uh, clear vision because he keeps going into he mentions all kinds of scientific uh, concepts and then he mentions his uh, he goes into von Uxel is that how you say Jakob, Jakob von Uxel the, bi the uh, biologist um, he says oh there's a, um, the biologists are worried about human uh, humans supposing themselves to understand what it's like to be an animal in this sort of he makes some comments that are basically like uh, today where we have an analytic philosophy, that, um, what's it like to be a bat, except he doesn't make it in the context of um, the theory of consciousness, but he makes it rather in more in the uh, context of the um, biological um, science of that day. Um, so again, what's our... Uh, so I want to... Are we permitted then to say Heidegger uh, is speaking in 38, 39, Nietzsche was speaking in 18, a little past 1870, both in the war periods. Um, what prevents us from bringing in all the extra texture? Uh, or the, for instance, Alexander Dugan says that the, the great thing about philosophy is it brings everything in and um, Besides from history and uh, science and um, all everything, politics, and he adds uh, geopolitics. Uh, does Heidegger really follow his own rule if his actual guiding question is only uh, to get as close as possible to these um, as though... Um, uh, to face everything that is at all characteristic about what we're talking about, every personal characteristic. Um, I'm inclined to bring more of the details in, but we w should um, stick also as much as we can to see what Heidegger, how so far he follows his own um, his own ways, and he, if he can give us guidance. This whole question of the guidance uh, is coming in. Uh, so I was mentioning the idiosyncrasy. I wanted to mention that before, is that um, it's quite often said that the idiot um, is this um, figure in the Greek life that's excluded from public life. And if you were to stand outside of public life, you're an idiot. Um, and that's maybe, um, that's accurate, but it doesn't give us enough. So if you look at the usage you find out that the idiot often means something like the layman, so like somebody who doesn't have an office, who doesn't have um, a publicly useful office such as um, a lawyer or a doctor, um, is a layman. But that could go for anything, the medieval um, corporations or um, the guilds, you have a hundred different, you know, candlestick maker, um, uh, Leather, uh, leather worker, or, uh, furniture makers, whatever it is, these are all supposed to be um, 
in the service of the country and probably so far as they aren't merely expedient in the service of human life as such and therefore in the service of reason. So this contrast between reason and the idiosyncratic is different than what we're used to. We're used to the contrast between objectivity and the subjectivity. Um, this too is a, a issue of the texture of the time where we're making this analysis. And we don't know if we're making this analysis ourselves according to what expediency, according to wh what is appearing important to us. Why are we drawing it out? What is our purpose? So we're faced with the same question of uh, how so far have we forgotten the purpose and committed the error, the most common form of stupidity.